Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this week's installment. So if you're passionate about earth energy, earth healing, geomancy, ancient sacred sites, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button for more insights. And don't forget to click the bell icon to get updated on my latest videos. So today we're diving into an absolutely fascinating topic, and this is how Earth's natural energy can really I believe, help revolutionise sustainable agriculture. So, so much of what we hear about ancient sites is what ancient man was doing in the past. Why were, you know, why did the Mayans build pyramids? Why did we build these sacred sites? Why did we build Stonehenge? And I think we have this conception in modern life that kind of separates somehow food, living, agriculture and spirituality as if they're different aspects of life. Um, but actually, it, it's not. They're on a spectrum of living when we think about it, aren't we? So, you know, there's a there's a deeply ingrained thread between the whole thing when we look at ancient sacred sites. So we look at a lot of the technology as something that is from the past and not relevant today. I don't think that's the case. I think there is a hell of a lot we can learn from these ancient structures that can be adapted for modern society. We don't necessarily have a societal program of works for building, you know, the main mountains of the Mayans, the, the, the pyramids. We're not going to be re-erecting huge stone circles or dolmens. But what we can do is integrate this technology into our own spaces and our own gardens. Agriculture, farms can put things, horticulture, we can build these um, structures. But why would we do that? Well, there's a lot we can learn from these, um, the subtle technology and the science behind ancient science. It is a science, it's, it's, but it's a subtle science that's connected to the earth. So when we have, you know, we're facing things like climate change, because climate is changing, whether we believe it's man-made or not. Um, and we, we're looking for sort of food security and environmental sustainability. We don't want to be pumping chemicals into the environment. It's crucial, I think, to consider all potential resources and to not rule anything out because as some we believe it to be sort of hocus pocus something that the ancients you know it was a belief but there's nothing behind it i think the earth's subtle energies are there to transform plant growth and health but they're also there to transform our growth and health and we are obviously a more complex organism than plants plants want to seed grow flower produce seed goes into the ground, start again. They're not riddled with all the, you know, self-consciousness and life lessons uh, and things that human beings are. But equally, this energy can help us work through those challenges. So, you know, there's, there's a lot we can learn from ancient technology. And when we um, look at what was built... It's, there's some really interesting phenomena that go into this. So let's look, for instance, at ancient um, sacred sites like things like dolmens. Now, I, for those of you who know, I, I see earth energy like real 3D um, with my ordinary vision. And when we have sacred sites, they're built over particular underground. A lot of them are built over particular underground geological features. So let's take, for instance, dolmens, which we often find over some form of underground water, as we do chambered cairns, as we do um, stone circles, as we do things like um, mounds, like Silbury Hill, for instance, in the UK. Now, there are different features of water that we find over these things, but underground water is a key feature. Now, the underground water, from what I can observe, you know, it has obviously um, charged ions coming off underground water, but that pulls sort of energy into the ground and it starts to form these swirling patterns, these vortices under the ground. And then above ground, we have this structure that kind of captures this energy. If it's in a multiple chambered cairn, it captures it along with earth energy lines that terminate in spirals into these um, cavities. Um, with things like mounds where we haven't got a cavity, it builds up and it's captured in the organic or inorganic layers within that mound. We can call this orgone, it's been called orgone. And then what that structure does 
whether it be a chambered cairn, whether it be a mound or whether it be a dolmen, it has captured some of that energy. There's a release mechanism where the surrounding area is imbued with this subtle energy into the ground. But what's really interesting about this, you think, well, so what? But we know, for instance, that crop germination around where we have sacred sites, and it's still possible to do this now on a small scale in your garden, crop germination is it happens more uniformly. So if you have a patch of seeds, they germinate more uniformly. They grow healthily. They're more stress resistant to disease and pests. They crop at a more uniform rate. So they get a good, healthy crop. That crop ripens faster. So if you're looking at a world where you're only going to survive the next winter if you have enough food, primitive societies, we call them primitive, that it's really important that you as a leader understand the earth energy dynamics of your area so that you can expose your food, your seeds, your animals and your people to as much of this energy as possible because it's going to promote their health and well-being. It's going to promote healthy seeds, healthy growth, healthy crops that are pest and disease resistance. You know, we you need food. When you can't go to the supermarket, when you've got to stockpile food for the winter, you've got to ensure you've got enough to eat and you've got enough seed to carry over to the next year. Understanding the energy flows in the ground is absolutely paramount. We also know, that, for instance, like working with animals, that you get sort of more healthier birthing of animals. You get things like less mastitis in cattle. There is a huge knock on effect of having these structures. So obviously they will affect human health and well-being as well. And there are key phases of energy that we obviously need to look out for. So we often find that things like um, sacred sites, you know, are aligned to sunset and the midwinter sunset and sun, sunrise and, you know, the solstices. That's what I'm trying to say. Aligned to the solstices. Well, of course, those are key features when you need to know um, where you are in the solar year because the spring and autumn sunsets and sunrise are quite ambiguous in terms of plant growth for plants to know where they are in the year what one of the key points are the solstices and also the equinoxes so the equinox have an effect for instance in agriculture uh on what's called the photoperiodism of seeds so that is under like a marker where the photosynthesis in the plant knows very much so that it's the spring equinox. So it's a really key key point in the plant's development and also for us to know when to plant because we need to plant seeds that give have the strongest likelihood of growing when we can't nip to the supermarket, when we're living in some, um, you know, eon of the past where communities had to be self-sustaining. There was no one going to come in and save us. We couldn't ring up international aid. We had to ensure that we grew enough food. So when we mark those key dates, the earth energy shifts, it's, it's absorbed by the plants. And if we expose plants to the energy in things like, um, let's look at the Mayan temples, which are still known as maize mountains, aren't they? Because if you put the maize seeds on there, as I said, they germinate more quickly, they grow more uniformly, they're stress resistant, they have a, a quicker cropping season and they produce a larger crop. That's really important because then you know that you've got enough food to sustain your people through the winter. And you also want to know when that's winter solstice is, so that you know where you are in the year. You want to know where the equinox is, because that's a key, crucial planting time, depending obviously whether you're in the North and South Hemisphere. So, um, you know, these the light photons make a difference. So we've also got the culmination, as I said, of this orgone that is imbued so when I look at things like Silbury Hill or ancient mounds, they're often over, like say, under huge volumes of underground water. And it might be a single river, it might be a crossing stream, um, depending on the type of structure. But they condense this sort of orgone into those, um, into its body. Now, if you have things like I said, chain cairns, you can put the seeds in the chambers. If you have mounds, you can, you know, potentially sit things on the top of them, but they also imbue this energy out like a waveform into the wider landscape to make the soil more fertile. Um, and that, that, that is key. Now, we don't use this technology at the moment. It's kind of like, oh, it's a bit of a mystery. But we can um, employ it in agriculture and horticulture. I have done it. 
I have clients now who are doing it. Um, but it also, they also help us. I think we have this, um, we forget, I think in modern times, that living is a spiritual act. And while these energies help plants and animals, you know, live their healthiest, they also have a huge effect on us because there's a there's an extra element when we interact with them as human beings. So when we are using sacred sites, they are usually they are often located near geological fault lines. And it's the 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 changes, the shifts in the electromagnetic spectrum um, trigger neurological changes in us. They trigger different neurochemistry, which enables us to have these um out of body shamanistic experiences where we first of all go into this kaleidoscopic geometrical patterns like tunnels or like going around toroids donuts and then it opens out into something where we then you know start to move through the universe extending towards the milky way on this pathway so if anybody's had um you know you'll recognize this if you've had kind of shamanistic experiences so um so those sites enable us to see beyond the human time scale and see beyond the human reality. And that enables us then to take in sort of guidance and lead people in a totally different way. Um, when I've done um, psychometry at ancient sites, which is something that just started to happen to me naturally as a child, the mindset that I go into, which was presumably very similar to people's mindset in the past, is very different than how our minds operate nowadays. We have a very literal, compartmentalized and everything separate kind of mindset, but it's almost like being in a permanent, it's like a dream state. And you see the world very differently and everything flows. And very early on, that those experiences left me with a profound sense of what is physical, but also that behind everything, is this kaleidoscopic energy and their energy patterns. And it's those patterns that give rise to the shape and form of things in our physical reality. I have my own energy pattern in my aura, so do you. And they're all unique and so does a tree, but it's not just in this space. It exists, if this is the physical space, it exists, as I say, just beyond the veil. And when we have a shamanic experience, we move into these other dimensions where everything is energy. And these sacred sites enable us to do that. So there are optimum site times of the year for us to do this. Um, it makes a difference. Um, particular sites can be aligned to particular things. And it's on those days that there's sort of a, a shift in the natural earth energy in that site. And that we can better utilize that site to, as I say, support our physical life through healthy animals, um, physical health, but we can also utilize that how that site to enhance our spiritual growth because it's a site that lends itself to being used at that particular year that particular time so over visiting you know sacred sites in many different places at many different times um, I can see the energy and I can see when some are more active than others. So you can go to a stone circle at certain times and yeah, it's got some energy going around it, but it's much more active at other times um, of the year when it's aligned to particular energies, you know, like sunset, sunrise. And what uh, the solstice is, for instance, the, the other thing we also have to appreciate is that the structure that sacred sites are built out of, the types of stone that they're built out of, how paramag paramagnetic they are, and those kind of things also is a mechanism through which we um, can attract and accumulate this energy. So they act as like battery packs, if you like, that then imbue the landscape. But the problem that we have is that so many of our sacred sites, for instance, in the UK, you know, let's take that as an example or other areas. There are now bits missing. There are stones missing. Things have been moved. It's not um, dolmen, for instance, might just be some of them were covered in mounds of earth, but the soil has now gone. Some of them weren't covered, you know, but the ones that needed the soil to hold this energy, that soil is now eroded. So a lot of our sites are, are very much like we've got a bicycle that we could ride, but bits of it are missing the pedals are gone, the chain's not attacked. So we, look, we can look at it and go, well, this is a really complex piece of kit, but I don't know what it does. 
And we're never going to know, if you like, the full potential of these things until we build them again. And that's when I became fascinated years ago. Well, I can't build a massive stone circle on my own, but the scale of these things is really important. So these the big sites that we're using were built for whole societies to imbue large scale areas of the ground with this energy to enhance it. So that was a societal wide system. Everybody recognized we're going to build these. We'll build this one here. It'll have a zone of influence, say, so big. So we need to build another one over here. And then that will cover all that land. They will link up. So if you dot sacred sites at critical distances, then the whole of the land that you're working with is then enhanced in this way. But that requires a lot of people. And it also requires you to be able to douse for or see underground water, particular energy flows, see how they ebb and flow with things like lunar phases, whether they're electromagnetic in property, whether they're a sound in property. Um, so what vibration they kind of are. Um, and yet they're, they're on a massive scale. But that's the macro scale. So, you know, we know that the universe in effect is holographic. So we can find smaller micro versions of those same phenomena and probably you will have one in your garden. So what I started doing was making miniature versions of stone circles and miniature versions of chambered cairns and miniature versions of mounds made of organic or inorganic material and experimenting with these to see what the effects were on crops and growth and um, cultivation and things like that. And then these can be used then in horticulture and agriculture, which I've, I've helped people do. So, you know, we don't necessarily have to be erecting a huge megalithic structure anymore that we're going to use to enhance seed growth, that we're going to use to have shamanistic experiences en masse. We can do it so that they're in our property and we can utilise them because we haven't got a societal system that recognises this, which I think is a great shame. I think things like with pressing um, food security and environmental sustainability and the challenges that the world is facing, I think we would be as well to look at this ancient technology with a view to um, incorporating it into our modern system. And it doesn't have to be onerous and it doesn't have to be massive. There are different things that we can do. Um, we can utilize sort of things like um, like stone circle technology uh, with the right kind of stone, but it doesn't even have to be above ground. We can bury these things, for instance, under grain sheds so that that grain within that shed where we're storing it, it gets imbued with this energy so that next year when the farmer goes out and plants it on the field, it, it has the same effects as if it has been put in a stone circle or as if it has been kept in a chamber can. So there's lots of things that we can do. We can energize water with it so that um, plants require less irrigation um, and they utilize the water differently in the cell structure when we have um, changed the nature of the water um, because then plants need less um, irrigation to work. I think all these things uh, ha could have incredible benefit in today's society if more people would utilize them. Um, and I've been working on this for many years now um, in, in agriculture and in horticulture and, um, you know, and, and teaching people now how to use it. People are, who have got small holdings or, you know, enough ground outside. It may only be, a, you know, an acre, half an acre, but there is probably something that you can build in your patch that will not only help plant growth and animal health it will also um, help you you know we we don't necessarily need to um have you know we can build build things that we can still align with the equinoxes and the solstices and and still have that experience it won't quite be on the scale of being in some of these big bigger bigger sites but it's still if we're on, as an individual, it will still significantly affect us. It will, it can still change physically and how we feel, emotionally how we function. It can influence our states of thought, um, how we perceive the world, and you know, and it can help have psychedelic experiences. So I think you know we have to, we've got to get a view of the fact that life, um, all these sites operate on a spectrum. They help us 
from the physical to the spiritual. They are both practical and metaphysical. They're a multifunctional Swiss Army penknife of making things better. That's what a lot of these sites do. And it places us in synchronicity with the movement of the heavens and the cosmos. We want to know what's coming. We want to know how to prepare. We want to know how to, as a leader, you can have these, let's say, psychedelic experiences where you take some kind of psychotropic uh, substance like ayahuasca. You can go to the temple. You can commune with the divine. You're connected with something bigger than humanity. And then you can lead your peoples. Plus, you have the capacity then to imbue livestock and seed and people with these enhanced energies that you've drawn in from the landscape to make them fitter, stronger, healthier, and able to deal with whatever comes. So I think that's I think this is a hugely underexplored technology, which is why I've been on a mission personally to bring it into people's awareness for 20 years now. So um you know, learning how to use these things has a, has a huge, huge, huge impact on us. And um, yeah, so I think it's worth exploring. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, if you couldn't, if you could find out what to put in your garden, you know, whether you should be building a small miniature mound, a small chambered can, whether it's single chamber or three, three chambers, five chambers, whether you could put in a small um, equivalent of a stone circle or a, a standing stone, whether you could um, put in, you know, make a mound or you might need some banks, um, banks of soil. Um, it depends where you live. There, are, there will be something. But if you could find out, if you could find out what you needed to build, that would enhance your garden, enhance your home, enhance your family's well-being, would enable your pro produce to grow better, for instance, if you've got a small holding, would you be willing to do that? You know, would you be willing to just take some time and effort to erect something? Because, um, you know, some the people that I work with are, and it ha is having a tremendous difference. So I'd love to see here from you how many people would would like to do this because if we can't we haven't got a program of works so if our if our governments and our, and our you know our farming industry say en masse is not going to do this this is something that we can do ourselves in our own space we have to gather rocks we have to learn how to douse we have to do certain things but it is not beyond anybody's capability to learn how to do this and i'd love to know how many of you would be interested in this so that's really what I wanted to share today was, um, you know, how powerful and how valuable I think um, ancient geomancy could be. Um, all the principles of ancient geomancy don't have to be left in the past. They're very relevant to today, particularly in the challenges that we're currently facing. So don't forget to like and subscribe and follow. And um, yeah, I will see you for the next episode.